A very good evening and a warm welcome to one and all present here in this webinar session. I am Devolina from Clarnet. Clarnet is India's largest live digital CME and doctors generated medical content platform. So now with all of you, I would like to share a short glimpse of Clarnet. Thank you so much all for your patience. You can always find us on Google, which is www.clarnate.com. So now without further delay, I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Praveen to start with the scientific program. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dibalina. So good evening uh, and a warm welcome to one and all uh, who have joined for this uh, wonderful webinar uh, today, I mean today. So I am uh, Praveen S doing my pre-final MBBS from Madras Medical College, Chennai. State President of SNO Tamil Nadu. So I have here with my uh, with me uh, ma'am who was uh, who is assistant professor of anatomy from government OT Medical College the Real Greece. So uh, I am a JDN and uh, in collaboration with SNO Tamil Nadu. We have planned a series of lecture series in uh, neuroanatomy especially. Like we find like uh, we find that there is some gap in uh, uh, in uh, as far as neuroanatomy is concerned. Uh, so we thought, uh, why can't we invite professors uh, from anatomy and uh, have a lecture series in neuroanatomy? So this is the first lecture in the lecture series. And the man will be uh, taking the lecture series in neuroanatomy and embryology will be taken, uh, taken by uh, another professor who is from the same college. So without any further delay, I ask the ma'am to, uh, I request ma'am to take over the session. Okay, shall I start sharing? Yeah, you can start now. Okay, thank you. Okay, a very good evening to all my friends, my dear colleagues and dear students. I'm starting my first class on spinal cord. Usually- uh, I'm sorry for the interruption. Your screen is not in a full screen mode. I can see Please press it. Okay, so I'm going to start my lecture. First class on the spinal cord. It's uh, external features, blood supply, venous drainage, and the clinical uh, features related to the spinal cord. Uh, so when I start a lecture, it cannot be a boring session. I try to make it interactive, and then I'll be uh, giving some uh, questions also. You can also ask me some questions in between in the chat box if you want. So I'll, I'll go into the spinal cord proper. So what are the interesting facts you know about spinal cord? So when we start a spinal cord, it actually consists of 1 billion neurons. And then it is actually protected by over 120 muscles, around 220 ligaments and 100 joints. All these structures, they protect the spinal cord within the vertebral column. Spinal cord is present within the vertebral foramen. So I'll start with a clinical scenario. So in neat pattern questions, in neat pattern, uh, UG uh, pattern also, in PG also, we'll be having a clinical scenario. So here I start with a clinical scenario. A 62-year-old man who was a heavy drinker and smoker. So whenever we first start a question, we have to look for hint. Yeah, uh, here they have given a 62-year-old man. So he's a whole man. And then who was a heavy drinker and smoker? So he's a chronic drinker and chronic smoker. Consulted his physician about feeling a strong pulse in his abdomen. Usually we don't feel any pulsations in the abdomen, but this patient is complaining of, is feeling a strong pulse in this abdomen. So we need to think of these things. So there is a pulsation in the abdomen. Okay. And then he said, it felt like second heart. Even we will not be feeling our heartbeat. So when we uh, feel the heartbeat, it is called as palpitation. So it is an abnormality. Normally we don't feel the heartbeats, but uh, in case if we feel it, it is a palpitation. It's an abnormality. So that is actually an abnormal feeling in the abdomen. And he also complained about pain in his abdomen, back and groin. So the physician has arranged for a radiographic studies and then also including CT scans. So what do you think uh, the physician is thinking about here he's an old man, he's a heavy drinker and smoker, and then uh, he's uh, feeling a strong pulse in the abdomen, and then it is like a second heart, and then there is a pain in the abdomen, back and groin. So all these things are narrowing down to actually aneurysm. We can think the topic is about the spinal cord and the external features, but ma'am is giving a clinical scenario about aneurysm. Here, 
coming to the radiologist report. Okay, the plain X-ray showed calcium deposits. I'll give you some more hints. The plain X-ray showed calcium deposits in the wall of the abdominal aorta. Okay, so it is something related to aneurysm, and then we can think it can be an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Here, the plain X-ray also it is showing calcifications. Usually in X-rays, the calcifications can be picked up. The calcium deposits can be picked up. So to confirm the diagnosis, we have asked for a CT scan also. What does the CT scan shows? It revealed an abdominal aortic aneurysm that was around 11 centimeter in diameter. So it is an abdominal aortic aneurysm, first thing. Okay, it is a complicated thing. It is present in an old man who is a chronic heavy drinker and smoker. Okay. So what the physician is thinking uh, is he will be advising the patient for an abdominal aortic aneurysm repair. Before he could be admitted to the hospital for the repair of this uh, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, the patient passed out on his home. Why does the patient passed out on his home? Now the aneurysm has complicated. What happens is the aneurysm has ruptured. It has underwent ane aneurysmal rupture. So the patient passed out on his home. And then he was involved in a minor car accident. Okay, usually whenever the examiner sets a question, he'll be complicating more and more. We have to think, think. So initially they have given a heavy drug, uh, drinker and smoker, old man. So we are thinking about uh, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm and all. And then we were thinking about aneurysm, how it is related to spinal cord and all. Now he's still more, he's complicating. He's telling he was involved in a minor car accident. Okay, then. He was rushed to the hospital and then admitted for surgery for repair of ruptured aneurysm. Okay. What happened during the surgery? During surgery for repair of the ruptured aneurysm, there was extensive mobilization of iota. They are giving some more hints. There was extensive mobilization of iota and several segmental arteries were ligated. Now we have to think. What is mean by segmental arteries? How segmental arteries, aneurysm and spinal cord are related? Okay, and then although the iota was successfully repaired with, a, with using a Dacron graft, the patient was paraplegic. Some more complications. The patient became paraplegic, impotent, and his bladder bubble functions were no longer under voluntary control. So first thing, the, there was an abdominal aortic aneurysm. It actually ruptured. The patient also uh, was involved in a minor car accident. He was rushed to the surgery. In, during the surgery, there was extensive mobilization of iota and then segmental arteries were ligated. So when uh, uh, even after the repair of the aneurysm, the patient was not able to be stabilized. He, uh, he was paraplegic, important. His bladder, bubble function, everything has, uh, is no longer under voluntary control. Okay. So now we have to think problems. So what are the things in, the, in this scenario? how this is related to spinal cord. Uh, uh, you will be getting the answers at the end of this session. Okay, when, uh, when I'm starting this session, you'll not get all these things, how it is related, how the arterial supply is uh, important, how the venous drainage is important, how the patient is becoming paraplegic, all these things you will not understand. But at the end of the session, you'll be having getting the answers for all these things. So you need to get answers for what is the arterial supply of spinal cord. What is the most likely anatomical basis for the patient's paraplegia? There is an aneurysmal rupture. The rupture has been uh, cleared, but the patient is presenting with paraplegia. What is the anatomical basis behind this? And then number third, name the important artery supplying the spinal cord that was likely deprived of blood. So there should be some connection between the segmental arteries, uh, abdominal iota and spinal cord. Okay, so we have to find out what is the important artery supplying the spinal cord that will be likely deprived of the blood. And the fourth question, what are the predisposing factors for developing aneurysms? Initially, during the question session itself, they have given is a heavy drinker and smoker. Okay, so the heavy drinkers and smokers, they have a predisposing factor for developing aneurysms. Okay, and then why arterial supply of spinal cord is so important. Okay, we are seeing only the external features today. We are not uh, dealing about the internal features. The next class will be on the internal features. So the internal features, it will include all the tracks and all. But now, only the external features, how the spinal cord is there, what is the length of the spinal cord, how it is different from an adult and a pediatric, and what is the blood supply and all. All these things we are going to discuss today. So what is the learning objective? At the end of this session, you should have a knowledge about the features of spinal cord and then coverings of spinal cord and also the blood supply of spinal cord. Blood supply includes both the arterial supply and venous drainage. And then 
you should have a, you should apply the knowledge gain in this class in clinical practices and then also in the procedures like lumbar puncture and you should have a internalization about organization of the spinal cord and then you should also have a knowledge on prevention of complications by better orientation these are the learning objectives from today's class we are moving on to the topic proper so it's spinal cord so you all know it is a part of a central nervous system. The central nervous system consists of both brain and the spinal cord. So what is the length of the spinal cord? It is around 42, for 42 to 45 centimeters in length. And then it is, you all know, it is located within the vertebral canal. The basic things, all these basic things, you know very well, better but you should be uh, more knowledgeable. You should uh, actually uh, revise all those things. You should be back, back to the basics. Every time you have to uh, uh, be clear in your basics, because when you go to the postgraduate or when you, when you are in uh, MS general surgery or MCH neurosurgery, all the spinal cord and then neuroanatomy, neurosurgery alone is given more importance for the three years. But the basics, the basic anatomy is very important to understand all those things. Okay. okay. So it is located within the vertebral canal, occupying the upper third of vertebral column. Okay. What is the extent of spinal cord? In adult, it is different. And in pediatrics, it is different. Actually, it extends from upper border of C1 vertebra. So we have the vertebra, cervical vertebra, thoracic vertebra, lumbar vertebra, sacral vertebra, and then coccygeal vertebra. So it extends from upper border of C1. C1 is otherwise called as atlas. Okay, from C1 vertebra to lower border of L1 vertebra. So the spinal cord ends in the lower border of L1 vertebra in adult. So what happened in fetal life? What happens in the infants? During the third month of fetal life, it extends throughout the vertebral canal. But during birth, the, the lower limit of spinal cord is at the L3 vertebral level. In adult, it will be L1. In infant, in infant, it is up to the L3 vertebra, but during the fetal life, it extends throughout the vertebral canal. Why does these changes occur? Actually, these changes occur due to growth difference between the spinal cord and the vertebral column. Okay, what is the function of a spinal cord? The spinal cord consists of spinal nerves. All the spinal nerves, it arises, it emerges out from the spinal cord. It arises from the spinal cord. It emerges out through the intervertebral foramen. We have two vertebral foramens. Because spinal cord is situated within the vertebral canal, vertebral foramen. Okay. The spinal nerves also, it emerges out through the vertebral foramen. So we have two types of vertebral foramen. One is intravertebral. Another is intervertebral. So... Within the parts of the vertebra, when we consider a vertebra, it has parts. There is a body of vertebra and also we have the vertebral arch components. So within the vertebra, there will be a foramen that is called as intravertebral foramen. Inter, inter means between the two vertebras. Between the two adjacent vertebras, there is a gap, there is a foramen that is called as intervertebral. Actually, the spinal nerves emerges out through the intervertebral, whereas spinal cord is located within the intravertebral foramen. The main function is motor motor information it acts as a conduit of motor information it relay it uh, it has all the motor information and sensory information so from the center to periphery it acts as a conduit okay uh, about the sensory information it carries the information from the periphery and then give it to the center that is it acts as a, again as a conduit for the sensory information from periphery to center also it is a center for coordinating simple reflexes, not the complicated reflexes. Uh, simple reflexes are coordinated by the spinal cord. Main thing is motor information and then sensory information. So coming to the coverings of spinal cord. We all know the central nervous system has a meningeal covering. Brain also has meningeal covering. The spinal cord also has the meningeal covering. The coverings of brain are called as cranial meninges, whereas the coverings of spinal cord are called as spinal meninges. So as you all know, same. From inner to uh, outer, it is pia matter, arachnoid matter, and the dura matter. The outermost covering will be the dura matter. So the outermost covering will be the spinal dura matter. The middle layer will be the arachnoid matter and the innermost covering which is adherent to the spinal cord is called as pia matter. Okay. When we talked about the length of the spinal cord and extent of spinal cord, we said 
it extends up to the lower border of L1. So spinal cord ends at the level of L1. But what happens to this meningeal covering? It actually extends lower down. It extends up to the S2 level. Whereas spinal cord, it ends at the L1 level. But the spinal meninges and all, it extends up to the S2 level. So these are all the, uh, these are all, they are the prolongation of cranial dura. Okay. So spinal dura, it is the outermost layer. It's just a prolongation of cranial dura. And then it extends from foramen magnum until the lower border of S2. Whereas arachnoid matter, arachnoid matter also, it is a thin transparent vascular membrane. It above it is continuous with that of the arachnoid of the brain, whereas below it extends up to the S2 level. And then what about pia matter? Pia matter is also a vascular membrane. It is bound tightly with the spinal cord. It is modified at some places, and then uh, it is modified at some places to form the modifications. Okay, there are only three coverings from inner to outer. It is pia matter, arachnoid matter, and dura matter. The one thing you have to remember here is it extends up to the lower border of S2 level, whereas spinal cord ends at the level of lower border of L1 level. Okay, coming to the modifications of pia matter. We have seen the dura, arachnoid, and pia matter. There are some modifications. What is that modification is meant by? Modification is that. Actually, the entire spinal cord, it is uh, covered by pia matter, but lower down, at the end of the uh, lower down of the spinal cord, it has an prolongation. The pia matter, it will be prolongated as a thin, delicate layer, and then it will be extending up to the coccyx, because spinal cord ends at uh, L1, whereas the spinal meninges, it ends at S2, but the modification of pia matter, that is phylum terminal, it is extending up to the coccyx. Okay, it is actually attached to the coccyx bone. Okay, and then the uh, we have totally 20 centimeters. The phylum terminal is around 20 centimeters long, this green thing. In this picture, you can make out now, this is the lower end of the spinal cord. And this one, actually, this is the conus medullaris part of the spinal cord. From this end, there is a prolongation as a thin, delicate membrane, which is a modification of pia matter. It is around 20 centimeters long, in which... 15 centimeter lies within the dural sheath, whereas the 5 centimeter lies outside the dural sheath. Okay, so the within the dural sheath, it is called as phylum terminate internum. The part outside the dural sheath is called as phylum terminate externum. So the spinal cord ends here, it is L1 level. So the dural sheath ends here, it is S2 level. But the 5 centimeter outside the dural sheath, it is attached to the coccyx. It is called as phylum terminal externum. Some book says it is also called as coccygeal ligament. It will, it will be like a just a thin ligament. So it is called, it's also called as coccygeal ligament. So the second modification is called as ligamentum denticulata or otherwise called as denticulate ligament. What is the denticulate ligament? Denticulate, it means tooth-like projections. So this is the outermost covering in this picture, this blue color. This is the outermost covering. So this is the dura matter. This pink color, light pink color is the arachnoid matter. And this yellow color covering is the pia matter, which is encircling the spinal cord, which is adherent to the spinal cord. Okay. And then what you are seeing are the nerve rootlets. We told you, no, the spinal cord. From the spinal cord only, we have the spinal nerves arising. The spinal nerves will be arising from the spinal cord. It, it actually arises as several nerve rootlets. So you have to think about a tree, how a tree is formed from the uh, rootlets, the root is formed from the root, the trunk of the tree is there. From the trunk, we have the divisions. From the divisions, there are branches like that of a tree, the same way the spinal nerves also, it will arise as a numerous nerve rootlets. So you can see here, these arises as a numerous nerve rootlets. They unite to form a single root. Okay. Anteriorly, we have one root that is called a ventral root. And posteriorly, we can see one root that is the dorsal root. So both the ventral and dorsal root, they unite to form a single trunk. That is called a spinal nerve trunk. From the spinal nerve trunk, again, it will be divided into ventral rami and then dorsal rami. Ventral means anterior, dorsal means posterior. So it has an anterior rami and posterior rami. Again, all these rami will be divided into divisions. It will give a divisions. From the divisions, we'll be getting the branches. The same way, when we talk about brachial plexus and upper limb and all, you can uh, think of the 
what is the root value they will be asking you know what is the what is the root value of median nerve what is the root value of radial nerve it is nothing but actually it is a branch median nerve and radial nerve is a final terminal branches but it what happens it actually arises from the brachial plexus brachial plexus are formed from the roots c5 to t1 roots they all form the upper trunk middle trunk lower trunk and then all these trunk it will be divided into anterior division posterior division from the divisions we will be getting the cords from the cords we will be getting the branches okay same way the spinal nerve has a uniformity they will be forming from rootlets roots trunk and then rami divisions and then branches okay okay so We are we are we want to see about the ligamentum denticulata. What is ligamentum denticulata? It is a modification of pia mater. Denticulata means tooth-like projection. Where is this tooth-like projections are present? Means it is between the dorsal root and ventral root. The spinal nerves has dorsal root and ventral root. No, between these two things, we will be having a tooth-like projection. There are around twenty-one teeth-like projections. They are called as ligamentum denticulata, or otherwise denticulate ligament. So, in this, this projection is the denticulate ligament. This purple color projection, teeth-like projection between the roots, is the denticulate ligament. Okay, so this is the real picture. This is not the cut section. It is the entire spinal cord is uh, here. We are viewing from the anterior aspect. So, this is the anterior view of spinal cord. Can you make out the central? part here there is a marking there is a depression this is called as anterior median fissure of spinal cord so anterior median fissure of spinal cord this is the spinal cord and then thin white membrane attached here is the pia mater and then can you see the nerve rootlets arising from here so these are several nerve rootlets they are going to form the roots and then trunk okay and then between these roots can you see the projections these are the teeth like projections these are called as denticulate ligament this is modification of pia mater okay coming to the third modification we have four modifications of pia mater first thing we have seen the phylum terminal phylum terminal it is an extension from the lower end of the spinal cord uh, up to the coccyx okay that is phylum terminal second we have seen the ligamentum denticulata or denticulate ligament okay third modification is linea splendens and then fourth modification will be subarachnoid system so to understand this we need to know about the horizontal section of the spinal cord so this is a cross section transverse section or horizontal section everything is same okay this is the horizontal section of spinal cord this is the inner gray matter okay this will be the inner gray matter with the gray horns and then we have it is the outer white matter Inner gray matter, outer white matter. Okay, actually the spinal cord is a cylindrical structure. It is not completely cylindrical. It has a depression in the center and it has elevation on the lateral aspects. The depression in the center, in the anterior part, it is called as anterior median fissure. The depression it extends in inner into the white matter. Okay, the depression will be extending into the white matter to form a fissure that is called as anterior median fissure. Posteriorly, also we have a depression that is posterior median fissure. So on lateral aspect, there is the elevation that is called as posterior lateral sulcus. This is posterior median fissure. On lateral aspect, we have the posterior lateral sulcus. Anterior also there is a anterior median fissure. Laterally, we have the anterior lateral sulcus. Okay. So coming to linear splendens. What is linear splendens? It is a thickening of pia mater. One second. It is a thickening of pia mater along the anterior median fissure, extending from C1 to L1. Okay, so the pia mater will be thickened. The pia mater will be thickened at the anterior median fissure to form a linear splendens. Okay, we have seen the inner gray matter, central canal, outer white matter, anterior median fissure, posterior median fissure, posterior lateral sulcus, and anterior lateral sulcus, and linear splendens. Okay, what is this? this is the anterior root or ventral root and this is the posterior root or dorsal root both these as united to form a spinal nerve trunk so this is the spinal nerve emerging out of the spinal cord we can actually make out in the horizontal section okay we have uh, i have told you no there is ligamentum denticulatum will be present between these two nerve rootlets 
So between the ventral and dorsal nerve rootlets, there actually there is a teeth-like projection that is a ligamentum denticulatum. Okay. So what are these things? These are all the coverings of the spinal cord. Okay. We are actually seeing this thing within the vertebral foramen. Okay. So the outermost covering will be the dura matter. And then we have the arachnoid matter. And the innermost covering is the pia matter. So what is this space then? Between uh, uh, this uh, arachnoid matter and pia matter, we have a space. What is the space called? It is otherwise called a subarachnoid space. So subarachnoid space is a space between the pia matter and the arachnoid matter. It is actually large. It is actually huge. Okay. So anteriorly, we don't, uh, we have, we don't have any septum. It is actually communicated with each other. But posteriorly, can you, can you make out the septum? Actually, the septum is an elongation from pia matter to the arachnoid matter only on the posterior aspect. It is present in the subarachnoid space. It is actually splitting the subarachnoid space okay, into right and left thing. So this is called a subarachnoid septum, which is a modification of pia matter. The pia matter has modified and it has extended to up to the arachnoid matter to form a subarachnoid septum. So what are the four modifications of pia matter? First thing is the first one is the phylum terminal. Okay. And then second one is the ligamentum denticulator. Third is the, we have the linear splendens. And fourth is the subarachnoid septum. Okay. All these are modifications of pia matter. Okay. What are the spaces related to the spinal cord? We need to know about epidural space, subarachnoid space, subdural space. So actually anatomy is very easy. When you know about the nomenclature, uh, when you know about naming systems, you'll be easily understanding all these things. Okay, epidural, extradural, epi means what? Outer. Endo means inner. Okay. Extra means again outer. Intra means within the within the structure. So I told you no, intravertebral foramen. Within the vertebra, it is intravertebral. Between two vertebras, it is intervertebral. Okay. Outside the vertebra, it is extra vertebral. Like that same way, outside the dura matter, the space is called as extra dural space or epidural space. So you can see this picture. This is the anterior, this is the anterior end, and this is the posterior end. This is the vertebra. So we have, uh, initially when I started, I told you there are parts of a vertebra. Uh, vertebra has a body, and then it has vertebral arch components. These are all called as vertebral arch components. So what are the parts of a vertebral arch components? We know it has a pedicle, and then it has a lateral projection. This is called a transverse process, and then it has articular processes. It has superior articular process and inferior articular process. And then posteriorly, there is a projection. This is the lamina of vertebral arch, and this is the spinous process. Pedicle, transverse process, articular process, lamina, and then spinous process. So this is the intravertebral foramen. Okay, this is intravertebral foramen. So the coverings are, these are the coverings, coverings of the spinal cord. Only this is the spinal cord, inner gray matter, outer white matter. These are the nerve rootlets. That is, we have the ventral root, dorsal root, and then united to form a uh, single spinal trunk. Okay. And then uh, the when we consider a bone, the bone is also having coverings. It has a periosteal layer and endosteal layer. So the bone also will be actually uh, covered by the periosteum. Okay. So this is the periosteum covering the body of the vertebra. And then outermost covering is dura matter. And then we have arachnoid matter. And then we have the pia matter. This is the subarachnoid space. So from posteriorly, this is the periosteum. And then we have the dura matter. Sorry, this is the dura matter. This is the dura matter, arachnoid matter subarachnoid space and this is the pia matter. So can you make out this red thing? This is actually a space outside the dura. Outside the dura, there is a space between the space between dura matter and periosteum of the bone. So this is called as extradural space. The space outside to the dura. It is called as extradural space or epidural space. Okay. Subarachnoid space, already we have seen. That is between the arachnoid and the pia matter, there is a space that is a subarachnoid space. Then what is subdural? Subdural should be, it should be within the dura. That is outside the dura, we have the epidural or extradural. So inside the, within the dura, we have between the dura and arachnoid matter, there is a small space that is called a subdural space. Okay. 
So epidural or external, it lies between the spinal dura and periosteum lining the vertebral canal. The contents will be only the loose area of tissue and semi-liquid fat. And then the spinal arteries and internal vertebral venous plexuses are present in the epidural space. So this is very important. The arteries, the venous, the veins supplying the, the arteries supplying the uh, uh, spinal cord and then vertebra and also the venous drainage by the veins are all present in the epidural space. Okay, the epidural space consists of all the spinal arteries and also the internal vertebral plexus. Internal vertebral plexus. Actually, this internal vertebral plexus, they'll be piercing the posterior surface of uh, vertebra, body of vertebra. It will enter into the vertebra and then it will be supplying the bones. So, epidural space consists of Spinal arteries, internal vertebral venous plexus. Subdural space, it is a potential space between the dura and the arachnoid matter. It also contains only a thin film of serous fluid. It acts as a lubricant. It just acts as a lubricant. That's all. Subarachnoid space, it's very important. Why subarachnoid space is important? It is relatively a large space between arachnoid and pia matter. It is filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Brain also has subarachnoid space, which has the subarachnoid cisterns, and also it has all the uh, CSF, okay, cerebrospinal fluid is present within the subarachnoid space. So the CSF actually communicates from the ventricles, it has a communication lower down into the spinal cord, the subarachnoid space, it, it is continuous, the, uh, it is continuous from the brain, it is continuous with the spinal cord. The CSF also, it is com uh, continuous with that of the brain and then spinal cord. So it communicates with subarachnoid space around the brain at the foramen magma. So below the level of conus medullaris, apparent we have seen it is continuous with the top brain. What happens in the lower end? Actually, in the lower end, what happens is this uh, subarachnoid space is more roomy. Roomy means it is it is a, such a large space. It is called a cistern. We have cisterns in the brain also. There it is called a subarachnoid cisterns. In the lower down, we have the cisterns, uh, quite large space for the CSF fluid that is called as lumbar cisterns. Okay, so we have the lumbar cisterns below the level of conus medullaris. It, it, not only the CSF is there, in the conus medullaris, we have all the nerve roots, cauda equina. What is cauda equina? It is like a horse tail. Okay, we have all the nerve rootlets from lumbar plexus uh, and then sacral plexus, coccygeal plexus of nerves. All these things, nerves will be, it will be merged. It will be uh, in the pool of a CSF. Okay. Uh, can you make out this uh, section? So what section, at what level this has been sectioned? Can you all think? Can you please uh, give answers in the chat box so that I can uh, see later? I'll give you some one minute to think at what level this has been sectioned. What is the important of this section? Identify the pointed thing. You know, it's a spinal cord. But at what level this has been sectioned? This is a cross-sectional anatomy. Okay, I'll give you the answer. Actually, this is an horizontal section of head and neck, horizontal section of head and neck at the level of C1 vertebra. Okay. The section has been made at the level of C1 vertebra. This is the oral cavity. Laterally, you can see the ears. And then posteriorly, this is the cranial fossa. We have three types of cranial fossa, no? anterior cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa, and posterior cranial fossa. So this is actually the posterior cranial fossa where we are seeing the lobes of cerebellum. So this, are, this is the cerebellum, cerebellum. And then this is the foramen magnum. The level below the foramen magnum where we can able to see the spinal cord, the spinal cord and then nerve rootlets and then meninges and all. Okay. You can also make out the spinal arteries supplying this thing. Right? Okay. And then identify the arrow marked space. This is the lateral view of spinal cord. This is the lateral view of spinal cord within the vertebras. So these are the vertebra. I'll give you some clue and all. Okay. 
So can you see these are the projections, posterior projections. These are the spinous processes. With the help of the spinous process, we can actually identify what level of vertebra is that. Okay. Here, the spinous processes are projected downwards, directed downwards. So mostly the thoracic vertebra, the, the spinous process will be long and they are directed and then projected downwards. Whereas the lower down lumbar vertebras, they will have a short and stout spinous processes. They are projected backwards. Okay. When it is projected downwards, it is thoracic vertebra. If it is uh, projected backwards, short and stout, it is lumbar vertebra. So this is lumbar vertebras and these are the thoracic vertebras. And this is the body of the vertebras. And then can you see the vertebral foramen? This is the intravertebral foramen where the spinal cord is located. And these are the nerve rootlets arising from the spinal cord. It is forming the spinal trunk. Okay trunk of spinal nerve. These are all called the spinal nerves. And then the outermost covering is the dura mater. And then we have the arachnoid matter and pia matter is actually adherent to the spinal cord. And we can actually make out this projection, teeth like projections here. This is ligamentum denticulatum. The pia matter, there is a teeth like projection that is denticulatum or denticulate ligament. Okay. Okay. So the space the space between the dura mater and the periosteum of the bone. So this is the epidural space. So this is the epidural space here. And then identify the pointed thing. So this is section at the abdomen level. Okay. So I'll tell you this is the anterior. This will be the posterior. This is right side. This is left side. Okay, then we have the liver. So this is the outer skin, outer skin. And then we have the superficial fascia and then superficial fatty layer and all. These are all fat. Okay, between the superficial fascia we have the, and the muscles, we have the superficial fat. And then these are the abdomen muscles. We have the external, external oblique, internal oblique, and then transverse abdominus muscles. All these are going to form the abdomen muscles. And then we have the liver. Okay, right side, we have the liver. And these are all the loops of intestine. And then here you can make out the kidneys. This is the kidney. This is the kidney on either side. And then in front of the vertebra, we have two lumen. This is the luminal structure or curve. We have the right side inferior vena cava and left side we have the iota, abdominal iota. So luminal structure, if you can make out now, it is the one is the iota, another will be the inferior vena cava. And this is the body of vertebra. This is body of vertebra, transverse process of vertebra, this is spinous process of vertebra. So this is the vertebral foramen. Within the vertebral foramen, you can see the cauda equina. This is the lowermost part of spinal cord. Okay, lower end of spinal cord. We can able to see only the nerve rootlets. That is the cauda equina. Okay. Initially, when I started, I told you there are some interesting facts. Numerous bones, numerous ligaments, numerous muscles, they protect the spinal cord. Can you see? This is the spinous process of vertebra. This is transverse process of vertebra. And these are the articular process of vertebra. They are articulated with each other. Okay, and they have numerous ligaments. These are the ligaments, ligaments and then muscles. Everything is protecting the spinal cord. And also the spinal meninges is also protecting the spinal cord. What is the clinical importance? We use epidural anesthesia. What is epidural anesthesia? The anesthetic solution is injected through a catheter into the epidural space at a desired site without piercing the dura matter. We are not getting into the meningeal coverings. We are just reaching the epidural space. We are just injecting the anesthetic solution. Okay, That actually, the spinal nerves is emerging out through the intervertebral foramen. After it comes out of the uh, dura matter, it will be entering into the epidural space. So what happens is this solution, it go and uh, numb all the spinal nerves. Okay, they, Those are all transversing the epidural space, right? So this solution, it is uh, making the spinal nerves numb there. there. Why it is important? Why it is applied? Why the anesthetic solution is applied in the epidural space? To for because in, in the purpose of painless labor because labor is a painful thing. So for uh, for the patient who can uh, afford and then who, can, who are all willing for the epidural anesthesia for the purpose of painless labor, this can be used. 
and also for the post operative pain relief in case of total hip replacement total knee replacement and all there will be so much of pain we cannot uh, give the analgesics alone that will not relieve any pain so the patient needs so much of uh, anesthetic solution to uh, get relief from the post operative pain for the post operative pain relief we can use epidural anesthesia and also for to relieve pain in the cancer patients because cancer patients they have so much of pain we need to relieve the pain for them. and this is the thing okay first we have the skin and then we have the spinous ligaments muscles and all the needle the catheter is inserted into the epidural space so this is this is the lower end of that is tail end of spinal cord the spinal cord it is ending here and then we have the spinal meninges extending up to the s2 level near the lower border of l1 the spinal cord ends and then we have only the cauda equina and then spinal meninges extending up to the s2 level so this epidural catheter is inserted into the epidural space okay so lumbar puncture so lumbar puncture is a nightmare for all the crri people so when we are posted in uh, house surgeon when we are posted in pediatrics when we are posted in medicine we should be able to do a lumbar puncture so when i was doing a house surgeon i was posted in pediatrics posting and the first day of posting i was in neonatology they they asked me to do a lp for a neonate i don't know how to do a procedure and then i was under very much terrified only during that time the post graduates and then staff nurses they helped me to perform this lumbar puncture so this lumbar puncture is one of the important uh, thing because in infants and neonates and all meningitis is more common so we need to take the cerebrospinal fluid and then we have to send for pathological analysis with the help of the analysis only we'll be able to uh, find out whether it is a bacterial procedure performed in all the pediatric wards and also in the adult patients okay so it is performed to obtain samples where we are going to get on second uh okay so where we are able to get the csf csf is present in the subarachnoid space okay so it is collected for various diagnostic and therapeutic purposes also in case of hydrocephalus hydrocephalus also will be taking the csf and will be relieving the pressures okay it is a therapeutic procedure diagnostic procedure is to diagnose a meningitis in case of neonates so a lp needle is introduced into the subarachnoid space to the interval between the third and fourth lumbar vertebra okay why it is inserted into third and fourth lumbar vertebra because it is in, it, the spinal cord ends at the level of l1 so we need to insert the needle lower down to the spinal cord or else we, we will be injuring the spinal nerves no so we should not uh, touch the spinal cord we have to enter into the only the subarachnoid space so below that level only we need to uh, inject the lp needle lumbar puncture needle okay to take the csf from the subarachnoid space okay in case of spinal anesthesia also the anesthetic solution is injected into the subarachnoid space it mixes with the csf and then it get anesthetized so this is a uh, procedure so we'll be getting a important question during our viva during our uh, examination and all we'll be getting an important question what are the layers pierced during a lumbar puncture procedure what are the layers pierced during an lp procedure okay so we need to remember these things okay triple s triple s i l e d a s okay this is a mnemonic usually used triple s i l e d a s so first s is skin from the posterior aspect okay from the posterior aspect first thing uh, the needle piercing is skin and then we we have to pierce the superficial fascia and then third thing is the supraspinous ligament okay then we have the supraspinous ligament here it is uh, the supraspinous ligament is nothing but the ligament connecting the spinous process of the vertebra that is called a supraspinous ligament and then we have the interspinous ligament interspinous ligament is between the spinous process of adjacent vertebra we have a interspinous space so this is the interspinous ligament and then we will be having the ligamentum flavum and then we have the epidural space and then after the epidural space only we have the meningeal coverings so this picture will be very clear first is skin second is superficial fascia 
third is supraspinous ligament and then fourth is interspinous ligament and then fifth is ligamentum flavum and then sixth is epidural space and then dura mater and then we have the arachnoid matter and then the subarachnoid space okay skin superficial fascia supraspinous ligament interspinous ligament ligamentum flavum epidural space dura mater arachnoid matter and then only subarachnoid space these are the layers piercing while doing a lp procedure this is an important question and positioning of the patient if the patient is lying on a couch, we can use the lateral positions. That, that is left lateral position or, uh, or the right lateral position. And then we have to ask the patient to flex the thigh at the hip joint and also flexes, flexes neck. Okay. So the flexion, universal flexion is actually followed in case of lumbar puncture when the patient is lying on a couch. Or otherwise, the patient is uh, asked, to, uh, asked to sit in a couch and then he has to flex his neck and also flex his thighs. And then we can use the this position for lumbar puncture. And spinal anesthesia also, this position is followed. There is a quick revision on the external features of spinal cord. As you all know, spinal cord is a cylindrical structure. It is somewhat flattened. Okay. And then lower end, it will be like a cone-like structure that is called a sconus medullaris. So what is cauda equina? Cauda equina is nothing but a bunch of lumbar sacral coccygeal nerves okay bunch of lumbar sacral and coccygeal nerve roots around the phylum terminal in csf is called as cauda equina okay cauda means tail equina means horse it is like a horse tail it the nerve rootlets will be within the csf along with the phylum terminal okay okay so how many pairs of spinal nerves are there we all know we have 31 pairs of spinal nerves there are eight cervical, 12 thoracic, and then five lumbar, five sacral, and one coccygeal spinal nerves. Okay, cranial nerve means there are 12 pairs of cranial nerves. Spinal nerves means there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Cervical eight, thoracic 12, lumbar five, sacral five, and one coccygeal. And what is spinal segment? Usually spinal segment is the length of the spinal cord giving origin to only one spinal nerve. It is considered as one spinal segment, okay. We have cervical enlargement and then lumbar enlargement. Cervical enlargement is the spinal segment where the spinal nerves, they are arising or going to supply the upper limb. Whereas the lumbar enlargement, it is for nerves arising to supply the lower limb. Okay, so this is the cervical enlargement and this will be the lumbar, lumbosacral enlargement. So spinal nerves. Already I have told you what, what is anteromedian fissure, what is postromedian uh, fissure and what is postromedian sulcus and then also the anterolateral sulcus and all. So one more thing, the revision, inner gray matter, this is the central canal, this is the outer white matter, anteriorly, this is called as anterior median fissure and these two are the anterolateral sulcuses and then we have posterior median sulcus and then posterolateral sulcuses and then we have the nerve rootlets arising from posteriorly, that is dorsal rootlets, ventral rootlets to form ventral root, dorsal root, and then near the dorsal root, there is a ganglion that is called as dorsal root ganglion. Both the root, it unite to form a trunk, spinal trunk. Okay, so this is dorsal root ganglion, this is a spinal nerve. And then same here, in the gray matter, outer white matter, these are the nerve rootlets, then forms the root, and then forms the trunk, and from the trunk, we'll have the rami and all. Okay. And this is the denticulate ligament, tooth-like projection. Between these two things, we'll be having the tooth-like projection of pia matter, which is a modification of pia matter. That is the denticulate ligament or ligamentum denticulate. Coming to the blood supply, very, very important. To know about the blood supply of spinal cord, we have to know about vertebral arteries. What is vertebral artery? Vertebral artery is actually a branch from subclavian artery. Subclavian artery is a branch from iota, arch of iota. Okay, so right side, we have the right brachiocephalic trunk from which the right uh, subclavian artery and right common carotid artery arises. Whereas from the left side, I'm talking about arch of iota, I'm talking about arch of iota. From the arch of iota, only there are three branches. One is right side, there is a right brachiocephalic trunk. And left side, we have the left subclavian and left common carotid. Okay. From the subclavian artery, again, there are numerous branches. One important branch is vertebral artery. Okay. So these vertebral artery on either side, they'll be extending up. 
within the cervical vertebra transverse plus of cervical vertebra they unite to form a basilar artery they unite to form a basilar artery so there are two vertebral arteries on either side they unite to form the basilar artery after entering into the foramen magnum they form the basilar artery okay before formation of basilar artery they give numerous branches which one vertebral artery one is the posterior spinal artery another is the anterior spinal artery so the anterior spinal artery it arises from the vertebral artery it arises as two branches from two vertebral arteries and then it unite as a single anterior spinal artery these two spinal branches from two vertebral artery it unite to form single single trunk that is the anterior spinal artery which will be running down cordally along the anterior median fissure throughout the spinal cord and supplies the spinal cord anteriorly okay i'll repeat anterior spinal artery arises as two branches from two vertebral arteries they unite to form a single branch single uh, artery that is anterior spinal which runs downwards cordally along the anterior median fissure and supplies most of the anterior part of spinal cord okay coming to posterior spinal artery so posterior spinal artery it can be a branch from vertebral artery or a, uh, otherwise it can be a branch from pica pica is posterior inferior cerebellar artery so it can be a branch from posterior inferior cerebellar artery or uh, otherwise it can arise from the vertebral artery this will not unite to form a single artery this both uh, branches they run down as two arteries so we have only one anterior spinal artery but two posterior spinal arteries so these two posterior spinal arteries they run along the posterolateral sulcus okay laterally they will be running along the posterolateral sulcus and supplies the posterior part of the spinal cord so the important blood supply is one by the anterior spinal artery and second is by the posterior spinal artery we have only one anterior spinal and then two posterior spinal arteries anterior spinal is actually a branch from vertebral artery posterior spinal it can be a branch from pica or either wise it can be a branch from vertebral artery okay so these are the two important blood supply we have segmental arteries so coming back to the clay scenario uh so case scenario la i have told during the surgery for abdominal aortic aneurysm these segmental arteries were ligated there there was an extensive mobilization of aorta now can you think why it is uh, important here actually this segmental arteries they are actually branches from aorta okay we have the arch of aorta abdominal aorta descending aorta okay and then we have so many aorta arch of aorta descending aorta and then abdominal aorta okay so this segmental arteries actually they are the branches from abdominal aortas and also from the branches of descending aorta okay there is a comparison between anterior spinal and posterior spinal here this is the anterior view this is the anterior spinal they both they are running along the anterior median fissure whereas the posterior spinal it is running along lateral aspect all along the posterior lateral sulcus as two arteries and then it will be dividing into collateral branches here okay so this is the anterior median fissure it is running in the median aspect and it is supplying most of the anterior part whereas the posterior spinal it is uh, running along the post um, posterior lateral sulcus and then supplying the one third of the spinal cord here okay so the spinal arteries are also reinforced by the segmental arteries they are called as feeder arteries okay the anterior spinal artery supplies most of the anterior two third whereas posterior spinal supplies only the posterior one third of the spinal cord so this is a lateral view of the vertebral column and the aorta here this is the arch of aorta from the arch of aorta this is a common carotid and then we have the subclavian arteries and then it continues as descending aorta then it continues as uh, abdominal aorta and then from abdominal aorta it is divided into common iliacs two common iliac from the common iliac again there is a branch external iliac and then internal iliac can you see these segmental arteries they are branches from deep cervical ascending cervical posterior intercostal lumbar lateral sacral all these are branches from aorta okay these are all the branches from aorta uh, branches from uh, no, not the direct branches from aorta they are the branches from subclavian artery they are the branches from external carotid artery some are branches from descending aorta some are branches from uh, abdominal aorta okay so these segmental arteries they run radically they are called as radicular arteries okay they run radically and then they will be supplying the spinal cord 
we have from the vertebral artery there is uh, anterior spinal and posterior spinal actually it is supplying the entire spinal cord but also we have segmental arteries from the aorta it is supplying here so during what happens when there is an abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture uh, we have to uh, anyway we have to ligate all these things we have to ligate the segmental arteries here here and then t1 level t11 level and all we have to anyways uh, ligate all this uh, blood uh, arteries and then we have to cut so that this supply is uh, cut for the spinal cord in that case what happens this part of the spinal cord is, uh, is not getting enough blood supply it will undergo necrosis so it will undergo necrosis it will not get uh, enough hypoxia so all the tracks within that uh, level will be injured and there will be paraplegia so now can you think what is the relation between aorta and then spinal cord and the relation between spinal cord and paraplegia the relation between aneurysm and the spinal cord paraplegia okay all these are interlinked only one segmental artery they have given only one clue there the segmental arteries are ligated so when we if we don't have a knowledge about segmental arteries we will not have a thinking about why aorta and spinal cord are oriented here okay okay segmental arteries these are the spinal branches of deep cervical ascending cervical posterior intercostal lumbar lateral sacral arteries okay they reach the spinal cord has anterior and posterior radicular arteries along the corresponding routes okay they will be mainly supplying the spinal nerves that's why the spinal nerves are lacking the blood supply okay not the entire spinal cord is lacking the blood supply actually the spinal cord is receiving blood from the anterior spinal posterior spinal but the spinal nerves okay the spinal nerves at this regions and all it is getting the blood only from the segmental arteries so when the segmental artery is ligated and cut or if it is injured that part of spinal nerve is lacking the blood supply so it is resulting in the paraplegia okay we have large segmental arteries one is t1 and uh, t11 Th those are called as arteria radicularis magna this is important viva question uh, it can be asked as a neat pg question also name some arteries of adam kubik's okay so that is nothing but the arteria radicularis magna that is nothing but the large segmental artery of t1 and t11 thoracic segment coming to the venous drainage uh, so venous drainage again we have the longitudinal channels all these artery veins are all the longitudinal channels there are six longitudinal venous channels can you see the veins and all it uh, they are running along longitudinal aspect of the spinal cord these are called as longitudinal veins okay so we have median on the anterior and posterior along the median aspect we have the anterior median channels also along the lateral aspect we have the anterior lateral channels and posterior posterior also they are called as posterior lateral channels so antero median channels they run along the anterior median fissure and posterior median fissure okay anterior median vein posterior median vein and then antero lateral channels they run posterior to the anterior nerve roots that is ventral roots they are called as anterior lateral channels and what about posterior lateral channels they run posterior to the posterior nerve roots they are called as posterior lateral channels adha inga solliranga two median longitudinal one in the anterior median fissure and another in the posterior median sulcus two antero lateral channels one on either side of posterior to the anterior nerve roots two posterior lateral channels one on either side of posterior to the posterior nerve roots these are the venous plexuses so this is inner gray matter outer white matter it is running along the anterior median fissure posterior median sulcus and then antero lateral posterior lateral all these are forming the segmental veins here. even the segmental veins like segmental arteries we also have the segmental veins here okay not only these venous channels are on the draining this vertebra and the spinal cord we also have the segmental veins okay like that of artery we also have the segmental veins and this internal vertebral venous plexuses this internal vein, uh, vertebral venous plexuses constitute all these veins these are all very important why it is important is in case of a cancer for example uh, the first thing in case of uh, prostate cancer is this uh, metastasis usually cancers they will be they will not uh, come in the initial stages the patient will not come in the initial stages they will come only with the bone pain okay only when there is a bone pain we'll ask the patient to take an x-ray we'll, we'll ask the patient to take an mri uh, when we see uh, some of the metastatic changes in the bone and all we'll ask for a bone scan 
And then if we confirm the metastasis, we'll be asking the patient uh, whether he has a history of any uh, bleeding, bleeding per rectum or uh, bleeding per uh, like, uh, uh, like uh, what to say, hematuria, history and all. If we ask, the patient will be telling, yeah, I have hematuria. That is uh, blood in the urine. Okay. So when we retrospectively, we, when we inspect the cancer prostate, actually the cancer prostate, it has an rapid metastasis to the bone only through the internal vertebral venous plexuses. So here, uh, another neat PG question is internal vertebral venous plexus, how it is related to carcinoma prostate. Okay. And then another clinical importance is anterior spinal artery syndrome. If the only one anterior spinal artery is occluded by a thrombosis or compression, it can lead on to decreased blood supply to most of the anterior part of the spinal cord. So what happens? There is the motor symptoms are lost. Okay, the motor symptoms due to the involvement of, because all the corticospinal tracts will be lying in the anterior aspect. So all these anterior gray columns will be affected. In that case, we have the motor symptoms and also there is sensory uh, symptoms. There is bilateral loss of pain and temperature will be there. These all will be uh, uh, dealt in uh, internal features. Now, at least you should know about when the anterior spinal artery is uh, compressed or if it is uh, occluded, it will lead on to this motor symptoms, that is involvement of corticospinal tract and involvement of sensory systems also. Okay. The conscious proprioceptive sensation. We have so many sensations. We have pain, temperature, vibration and all. But this uh, proprioception, the conscious proprioception are, are alone is preserved because posterior spinal artery is supplying the posterior aspect. There only we have the tracks for conscious proprioception. So that is not affected so that it is preserved. The only symptoms is there will be motor loss and sensory loss. So summary of today's class, the length of the spinal cord you have to know. It, it is 42 to 45 centimeter. Adult, it is extended up to lower border of, uh, sorry, it is L1, I have written wrongly here. It is the lower border of L1. And in infants, it is up to L3 level. And the spinal meninges, it extends up to S2 level. Blood supply is mainly by the anterior spinal and the posterior spinal. Also, we have the segmental arteries from the uh, iota, abdominal iota, subclavian artery, and then descending iota and all. And the spaces related will be epidural space, subdural space, and subarachnoid space. Epidural space is mainly for epidural anesthesia. And then subarachnoid space importance is mainly we have the CSF there. So it is uh, for the lumbar puncture, we can uh, take the CSF for uh, CSF analysis for both the therapeutic and uh, diagnostic procedures to rule out meningitis and all. Okay. And then subdural space, it is just a potential space. It acts as a lubricant. Okay. Thank you. And then this is a clinical scenario for next class. You can have a look on this. Uh, a 21-year-old man was involved in head-on collision. When removed from a sports car, he complained of loss of sensation, voluntary movements in his lower limbs. Okay, there is loss of sensation and also loss of motor, voluntary movements in his lower limbs. There was also impaired ability of upper limb. Not only the lower limb was involved, there is impaired ability of the upper limb movements also, particularly in his hands. Okay, so the patient was kept warm and immobilized until the ambulance arrived. After examination at the hospital, x-rays, that is radiographs of this uh, vertebral columns were taken. What does the x-ray report says? There is a dislocation of C6 vertebra on C7 and there is a chip fracture on the anterior superior corner of the body of C7. So how it is important and how it is related to internal features of spinal cord. The problems here are the joints involved in the cervical region of the vertebral column. Which, which was located, which is causing the spinal cord compression. What ligaments binding the vertebra together were probably strained or torn? And what is the most likely cause of patient's paralysis? What other physiological function would no longer be under voluntary control? This all will be discussed in the next class. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Okay, thank you. It was, it was absolutely wonderful, madam. The thing is that like even MCI has changed, I mean, the NMC has changed the curriculum to competency-based medical education, right? Yeah. So you are giving clinical cases and stuff, and it was absolutely wonderful. And even, I mean, in the midst of the, uh, in the webinar too, I was receiving a nice, uh, I mean, reviews about the session that uh, it was oh. very clear and uh, stuff. So looking forward to, so like, ma'am, uh, for the- Am I too fast? Can no, your the face is absolutely right, ma'am. The face is absolutely right. Okay. And, uh, Fine, I think. 
and uh, for all the register for all the participants of the webinar today ma'am was pd when i was doing my first year in madras medical college so that way we got to know each other and she is absolutely a nice person we have to see the person really get to talk to okay fine uh, abelina i think uh, okay this question also can be if the, if i am getting the questions later on also in the next session i will be clearing all the question answers yeah fine so thank you for your uh, i mean thank you for accepting invite madam i thank you thank on behalf you. of ima jdn as well as sukuna tl looking forward for the uh, next session so thank okay. you madam we can uh, close this session we can close the session double enough okay thank you thank you madam